I do most of my research here at the Volga farm. All of the work I'm going to tell you about is supported by both the South Dakota Soybean Research and Promotion Council and the North Central Soybean Research Program, two checkoff organizations. And they really make the uh, soybean entomology research and extension in this state possible. So most of my research plots are actually south of that tree line over there. That's where the bulk of uh, research I do is. The reason why I'm talking here is because everybody always wants to know what is this thing? Any guesses? Some of you I talked to, so some of you know, no spoilers. Trap. Trap, Ex exactly. This is a suction trap for aphid monitoring. And this helps us monitor, in particular, winged aphid migrations. This is part of a trapping network that has about 30 traps in it throughout the Midwest. And the way it works is just basically a big old sewer pipe and it's got a fan motor at the bottom and it's open at the top and the fan motor pulls in uh, insects from up in the air column. So these are not insects that are just involved in short range from plant to plant flight, but things that are actually on the move going to other places. A lot of aphid species have a stage where they have a, a wing stage where they migrate and spread around. So the uh, fan motor sucks the air down from the top along with the aphids. There's a collecting jar at the base with preservative in it. The insects go into the jar and once a week we change out the jar and we send it to this poor man in Illinois whose job it is to sort through all the samples from the, these 30 traps and in particular he's sorting out the aphids, identifying the species, and how many of those different species we've got. And then we get a report each week on what the aphids are doing. And we can use this as a monitoring and an early warning system to tell us when different aphid species are likely to show up in fields as a problem. Uh, soybean aphid is a big one that we monitor for. Aphids, soybean aphids often go through sort of a, a migratory phase in early August. Their numbers build up in fields up, up through July. They get crowded. They produce winged offspring that then go up into the air column and spread around and colonize new areas. That's why we often see a bump of soybean aphid in fields that maybe didn't have much going on. We often see a bump in August because of this wing migration. This and the weekly reports we get from this help us to detect when that's happening, how much is happening in a certain region, and helps us give a, a predictive tool on what we may be seeing in our area for the rest of the season. We also monitor other species of aphids like bird cherry oat aphid, English green aphid, aphids that are more of a concern in small grains, but uh, largely uh, the, what I use it for is the soybean aphid monitoring. So that's, that's what this is. Uh, I know we're getting close to 10, so I'm going to be pretty brief here. I would like to tell you a little bit about some of the work we've got going on at this farm on two projects in particular. One is a uh, trial looking at aphid resistant varieties. Now how many of you who grow beans have heard about aphid resistant varieties? I see a couple hands up. A lot of people who grow beans haven't really thought too much about aphid resistant varieties. Maybe they know they're out there, maybe they've tried them. Have you guys tried them? Or any of the people you consult for? Underutilized tool. Uh, there are several genes that are coming out now uh, for aphid resistance. The oldest one, the one that's been around for several years and has been commercially available for several years is the RAG1 gene. RAG stands for resistance to aphis glycines. That's the scientific name for soybean aphid. We've also got a RAG2 gene. And then the newest thing coming out now, RAG1 and 2 genes pyramided together. We've been working with these for several years at SDSU in different contexts. This is some data from our plots on the uh, south side of these trees up through the end of July. And the first thing I'm going to point out is that we don't have, up through July, we don't have many aphids in this trial up through the end of July. We're really starting to see an increase in the aphids now, which for research purposes is good. Nonetheless, 
what I want to focus on most is the relationship between these lines that are the different resistant varieties because this relationship holds true whether we've got 30 aphids, 300 aphids, or 3,000 aphids. We see the same type of relationship. The red is the check. This is just a susceptible soybean. And you can see that it's got dram dramatically more aphids per plant, if you can call 30 dramatic, um, than the other varieties. The thing I want to concentrate on again is the relationship between these lines. Green line here is the RAG2 gene. It's sort of intermediate in performance of aphids, but definitely about half the aphids on the RAG2 that we see on the susceptible check. The blue line is the RAG1 gene by itself. This is the first gene that started becoming commercially available. And at the very lowest, with almost no aphids, is the RAG1 and RAG2 gene pyramided together in the same variety. We've had trials in aphids, aphid years, where generally Average, we see a tenfold difference in aphid numbers on the resistant versus the susceptible beans. Uh, this is a, really exciting to me as a soybean entomologist because we're always looking for different management tools that producers can integrate into their production. And I think aphid resistant varieties really have a lot of potential to be one of the tools that people use for aphid management. Any questions about? this. Yes, sir? I didn't see a lot of aphids on these. Does these plants have the resistant gene in them? These are uh, uh, just um, fill plots for foundation seed. And uh, I have to check with Jack, but I think um, he might have sprayed these uh, a couple weeks ago. Okay. Need to check with him. Yes, sir? Um, out on your iGrow site, you got an article about the economic threshold of mm -hmm. aphids. And that, that article, I think, was like 2007. And the number of 250 was quoted. Is that still a valid number? Or do you need to be Excellent question. The question is what to do with the economic threshold for soybean aphids, particularly now that soybean values are so much higher than they were back then. Uh, excellent question. The first um, point is to make a distinction between the economic threshold and the economic injury level. So the economic injury level is actually a higher value than the economic threshold. The economic threshold, I actually don't care for that term. I prefer action threshold or decision threshold. That's the point at which you make a decision at a lower level of insect, in this case aphids. You make a decision to line up treatment and control the problem before the population gets to the higher economic injury level, where, which is the point where the amount of yield you're losing pretty much equals the control cost, the break-even point. So it's true that the economic injury level is lower these days because the crop value of soybean is so much higher. So a bushel lost represents more money. So the question is, if the economic injury level is lower, how much lower should we make the economic threshold or the decision point? Because we're trying to keep it from reaching that value of the injury level. The thing that is most critical to understand about soybean aphid and soybeans when the values are so high is not even where is the economic injury level, but where is the damage boundary? That's something different altogether. It's related. The damage boundary is the number of insects that it takes before we can even detect any yield loss. Regardless of what the value of that yield loss is in dollars, where can we first even start to see those insects are having any kind of effect on the crop? That's the damage boundary. In the case of soybean aphids, the damage boundary is actually not too much different than the economic injury level when the crop value is very high. So let me put this in um, plainer terms. We can't even begin to detect yield loss in soybean until we have, on average, between 500 to 600 aphids per plant. 500 is a pretty safe value. Now that depends on some other things like the crop stress and whatnot, but a good average value is we can't even detect yield loss until we get to about 500 aphids per plant. And so it's just logically impossible to have an economic injury level that's below the damage boundary. Because how can you have economic injury or economic loss when you don't have yield loss? 
So I've been pretty much using 500 as my new economic injury level. So the question is how early do we have to stop an aphid population before it gets to that damage boundary? 250, you're not losing yield at that point, you're not at the damage boundary. Given the average aphid population growth rates, if you make a decision at 250 aphids per plant to treat, you've got four to five days to, to treat, to wait before treating, before you can expect to reach that damage boundary. Used to be when we had the 250 aphid threshold and the 675 economic injury level, we said you had seven days. Now, if you think you can treat in four to five days, you can still that pop, stop that population before the damage boundary. Yes, sir? How many bushels are we talking about when they're at five or 600 and how long a time? So we can, with enough replicated plots in scientific setups, we can detect when we get to most years, we can detect when we get to about 600 aphids per plant, we can start to detect a bushel loss. Okay, I'm, I'm getting close to the end there, but this is a really important topic, so I'm glad you asked. 